Namaste. Welcome to the session called From Illness to Wellness Through Yoga. I would like to start with expressing gratitude first to the Indian Yoga Association for giving us this opportunity to share our learnings on the occasion of the International Day of Yoga, a day that truly embodies the spirit of yoga, which means to unite, to join. And this is the day when hundreds of countries across the world came together in union, putting all their differences aside and recognized the power, the importance of yoga. So gratitude to everyone across the world who enabled this to happen. Gratitude to Swast Yoga Institute, an institution I have the privilege to serve at. And this is a program of Swast Foundation, the mother entity that hosts Swast Yoga Institute. So gratitude to Swast Foundation for enabling this work to happen. A little bit about me. My name is Garima. I have done my graduation in computer science and engineering from IIT Delhi. Also pursued my MSc and PG diploma in yoga therapy in yoga from Yasa University. I am a professional certified coach from the International Coaching Federation and have been trained in integral somatic psychology as well as plant-based nutrition. In terms of work experience, I have served as a management consultant at McKinsey & Company. Also served as a city director of Mumbai at a non-profit called Teach for India. Formerly the COO at Swas Foundation where I presently serve as a trustee. And finally, I've had the privilege of founding or rather to be found by Swast Yoga Institute, which is where I get to live my purpose on a daily basis. So with this introduction, we will now start with a prayer. I invite you to join me and repeat these words with me. Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunatu Sahaviryam Karvavahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastumavit Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Keeping your eyes closed, let the vibrations of these words settle down. Also allowing your body, energy, mind and emotions to settle down. And as you tune into the silence, Check with yourself. What is it that brought you here? What is it that you're seeking from the session? And how would your experience of life be if you were truly healthy, truly swastha? You may gently open your eyes and come back. So you all may have different intentions for joining the session, but the intention of this session, uh, what is common for all of us, is our well-being, to be swast, to be healthy. And so we hope that in this session, you will be able to look at and possibly adopt an empowering approach to look at your well-being, where your health, your well-being is in your hands. 
and then also get a range of tools grounded in the yogic sciences that enable you to walk towards your well-being. I want to start with asking you to reflect on a few questions. Check with yourself on a scale of 0 to 10. What do you consider is your own level of well-being? So how healthy are you on a scale of 0 to 10? Pick a number. Now also ask yourself, do you know someone with high blood pressure, with diabetes, anyone with menstrual disturbances? Think about each of these. Do you know someone with thyroid imbalance? Someone who struggles with weight? Do you know anyone at all, including yourself, who has faced back pain issues? or joint pain issues, or arthritis, or acidity and digestive issues, or sleep disturbance. Now check with yourself how many times did you actually count on your fingertips, how many things that you said yes to. And the chances are very, very high probability is that at least five things you, yourself, or people around you would have experienced. And so with this, if you can also check with yourself, who do you think would be healthier at the same age, you at your age or your grandparents when they were at the same age as you, who do you think would have been healthier? When I asked this question, I've asked this to hundreds of people and almost overwhelmingly, the answer is that our grandparents at the same age would have been healthier. In fact, even our parents are much more likely and were healthier uh, at our age. And what this is pointing to is the quality of our life. The quality of our life in terms of external comforts may be increasing, but our well-being is certainly decreasing. So then ask yourself, if we are here to learn about well-being and health, what is health as per you? Let us see the definition of health as per the World Health Organization. So as per WHO, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So you see from this definition that health is a positive concept. The absence of disease, of negativity, does not imply health. It is more than that. It is the presence of well-being. That's what health is. And WHO has also recognized that there is a spiritual component, a spiritual dimension uh, to health as well. Unfortunately, the situation today is not sustainable. In India, as well as globally, we are losing our health and wealth. Let us see how. 60 million Indians fall below the poverty line every single year due to a health shock in the family. A health shock refers to an event such as a heart attack, kidney failure, stroke that actually causes people to take debt, to seek debt, which puts them into a vicious cycle of poverty. This is not just the case with the vulnerable segment. In one of the most affluent nations of the world, in the United States, the expenditure on healthcare is five times its defense budget. Imagine a country that spends so much on defense, on defending itself from the external, is actually spending five more times to protect itself from its own self, that is from its own health, which has been falling and failing. So there is loss of wealth across the world. There is also loss of health. 60% of Indians die due to non-communicable diseases. This number is now close to 70%. So in India, we're living longer, but not healthier. In the West, where advances in medical science have reached a plateau. This is the first generation which is expected to live less than their parents. Again, the quality of our life in India, in the US, in any country of the world is not improving. We're losing our wealth, we're losing our health. Also, 
conventional approaches, approaches to health today are not working. Allopathic medicines are unable to cure chronic health issues. We've talked of blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid, cholesterol, weight gain, many, many, many other health issues. While allopathic medicines can help to manage the pain, they do not help to cure the disease and hence one becomes a patient for life. There is no cure for these in allopathy. Even our approaches to dieting, for example, are not effective, the present, the present approach. Research has shown that 83% of diets fail within six months. So people will go back to gaining the weight that they had lost and in some cases actually gaining even more weight. And this is also something you may have seen in your experience. Also, intense workouts are leading to people who are externally strong, but are internally fragile. And we see that people may be running marathons, maybe gymming, but there are many, many more cases, even amongst those who have a so-called healthy lifestyle of working out, there is cardiac failures, heart attacks that are happening unexpectedly. So conventional approaches are not working. In our understanding, our belief at trust, today we need an integrated framework for health. In our present context, we need to have, we need to yogify, we need to harmonize the West as well as the East. So we suggest a three-step circular framework starting from diagnostics, diagnostics. It is important to get ourselves tested. Again, a test may be externally through a device, or it may be by tuning in and becoming aware of our own state of body, energy, mind, emotions, and seeing what is our present state. Then the next step is to create a healing environment. This is a time when we may need medicines. We may need to go to a doctor. The, doc the doctor may be uh, allopathic, homeopathic, naturopathic. That doesn't matter. The fact here is that we need someone external to support us because our current environment itself is not supportive enough. So we may be consuming some medicines, getting consultations. Unfortunately, most people are stopping today over here. But there is a third step. There is a third step, which is to invoke our inherent mechanisms for self-healing. And that happens through what we eat, how we rest, how we exercise, how we cultivate peace, love, and joy. And when, we've, when we're doing our self-healing, we go back again and we test. We see what the impact that what we're doing is having on our well-being. And hence, this becomes a circular loop of self-improvement. We can move from a vicious cycle that the world is stuck in today to a virtuous cycle leading to health and joy. So I invite you to reflect on self-healing because the rest of the session is about self-healing. So ask yourself, what inside you needs to be healthy, needs to be swast, which is the Sanskrit word for healthy. Ask yourself. Most people say this, what needs to be healthy inside us is our body, our vital energy, our mind, and our emotions. One or both or all of these need to be swast, need to be healthy. Interestingly, if you put the first letter of these together, B-E-M-E, -E, here's what you get, B-Me. In other words, to be able to say, I'm free to be me with peace, love, and joy. And very interestingly, when you look at the actual, the root meaning of the word swast, the Sanskrit word swast, which colloquially means healthy today, swast is made of two words, swa and stha. Swa is myself. And stha is the same root as in the Sanskrit words sthan, sthir, sthit, or the English words like stable, established. Hence, swast means to be established in our own selves. And health is a natural outcome of being established in ourselves. 
This is what our ancient seers understood. Health is not a goal to be chased. Well-being is not something that we have to go after, run after. We are designed to be healthy. Everything inside us is trying to maintain a state of health, which is what scientists today call a state of homeostasis, which is internal harmony, a state of yoga. As a corollary to this, it is possible to reverse a wide range of ailments and to be healthy in future. We can be healthier than we were 10 years ago. Even if you're not healthy today, it is possible to do that. And we have done this. We have personally seen this in our own lives, in the work that we do. And there is hundreds and thousands and lakhs of studies, case studies across the world where people have gone back to their original state of health. All the health issues that I listed out for you earlier, all of those can be reversed. How? If, if we learn how to be established in our self. So if the goal is to be established in our sphere, to be established in our true self, let us go that, into that in a little bit more detail. Who am I? Who am I? What am I that basically I need to be established in? Here is where we look at the five dimensions of existence, which is called Panchakosh in the yogic science. Panch means five. Kosha means layers or dimensions. And yogis outline these five dimensions of existence, which are our Andamai Kosh, which is our gross body. And means food. So our body is made of the food we eat. Hence, it's the Andamai Kosh. It's the food sheath. The second Kosha, the seven, second dimension of existence is Pranamai Kosh, which is our vital energy. Pranamai Kosh is like the invisible electricity that makes a fan move, that makes a bulb shine. We can't see it, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Today, our heart is beating because of this vital energy. I'm speaking to you because of my Pranamai Kosh. The next internal dimension is our mind, our thoughts and emotions, which is called the Manomai Kosh by yogis. Even beneath that, is our Vijnanamai Kosh. This is our true inner wisdom, which sometimes we say the inner voice, Andar Ki Awaz. Different cultures call it differently. We can call it Ruh. There are many, many words for it. But this is what correlates to I am my true self, where we can experience a state of peace, love, joy, stillness, connection, flow, and so many other states that people have used to describe this. And beneath all of this lies Anand Maikosh. Anand means bliss. It means joy. Not the happiness that comes and goes, but the joy that is our true fundamental nature beyond all of this. Anand Maikosh or a bliss body is like the sun, which is present. It may get hidden by clouds. The earth may move away from it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's always there. When the clouds part, when the earth moves and comes back to a position where it's facing it, we see our true nature of Anand Maikosh, of the sun. So likewise, you can think of that uh, the, an example of children also. Children are always, always healthy. They're joyful. They're happy. That's their natural state. Sometimes they'll get angry. Sometimes they'll get upset. They'll cry. They'll perhaps shout. But very quickly, they'll go back to their natural state. As adults, we get stuck in our Manomai Kosh. We get entangled in our thoughts and emotions and we forget our natural state, which is of bliss. That's the beauty of the yogic sciences. They have actually outlined that happiness or rather joy is not something to seek outside. It is our fundamental nature and what exists within us. So therefore, what is yoga? If this is swast, to be healthy is to be established in our true self. In our Panchakosh, what is yoga? Yoga, which means to unite, to be in harmony, is the science of being in harmony with who we are. Health is a natural outcome of being in yoga. If we are in a state of yoga, harmony with our body, energy, mind and emotions, we will naturally be healthy.
And some of this may appear theoretical, so I'm actually going to give some practical examples also from my lived life uh, that has made this not just some theory that I've learned, but a very, very firm conviction for me. Before that, let's just see this overall framework, right? So yoga is a journey within of involution. Typically, we are caught up in reaching our full potential. This is the goal that we want to get to. What you see at the top right, reaching our full potential. What yoga says is that you will reach this if you start the process here. Don't be fixated on the outcome. Start with having internal yoga, being in a state of yoga with your body, energy, mind, emotions. Then manifesting that in your family, in your relationships, at work, becoming swast at all levels, like WHO says, physical, mental, social, spiritual, universal. And then reaching our full potential becomes a natural output. So yoga is a journey of involution. So you evolve by involving, by getting involved with our true selves. I'll share my life story, a little bit of that here. I, when I was working as a management consultant, after one year of working, I had an intense back pain issue uh, that came up abruptly. I didn't understand how and when it came up. And the back pain was spreading to my legs, to my arms. No position would help me, whether I was standing, sitting, lying down. I went in for Ayurvedic massages. Uh, I did uh, yoga asanas, yoga sessions, hypnotherapy. Obviously, I did all the allopathic Western medical tests, acupuncture, every single treatment, conventional or alternative that I could think of. But it was only when I actually spent some time as a patient at S. Vyasa, which is where I subsequently got trained from. That's where I understood that what I was trying to do was not address the root cause. I was doing yoga. I did not understand what yoga is, which is harmony within. And it is there when I was asked this question of what really makes me happy? What gives me joy? What is the root cause of my health issue actually start becoming clear to me? As I asked myself, what gives me joy? I realized that it's service that gives me joy. Working as, as a management consulting consultant working for corporates was not giving me the joy because it was not aligned with myself. It may have been aligned with someone else's nature, but it was not aligned with my swer. And working in the social sector, and I'd had the privilege of doing that as a management consultant, that gave me joy. And the day I decided to make a shift to the development sector, since then, my back pain has never come back. It has disappeared. I have trekked, swam, run, I done everything uh, that I could not have imagined doing at that point of time when I was just 23 years of age. So tuning in to my internal thoughts and emotions, which I had been ignoring, put me in touch with this question of what gives me joy. That enabled me to shift my work and therefore health became a state for me. As I moved along the journey, this next question came that how am I going to align my work to my source of joy? So I started working, as I mentioned, uh, in the development sector. And the more I aligned myself to the source of joy, the healthier I started becoming. I also recognized uh, that while I was improving on some dimensions of health, even working in the social sector, I got quickly caught up in the same mentality of chasing goals, of judging myself or people around me. And my health issues were also coming to coming. New health issues started coming up. And that's when I started seeking this question of how can I be fulfilled at all levels? Fulfillment at all levels. At not just a physical, but mental, emotional, spiritual. That's when I started exploring the various dimensions of yoga. Which is what I continue to do today at Swast founding or being found by Swast Yoga Institute was one of the outcomes of this process. And as I'm walking this journey, along the way, I have reversed many health issues, a genetic skin condition that no one thought could be reversible, early stages of PCOD, weight gain, 
many, many self-limiting and oftentimes self-destructive thoughts that I struggle with. And most importantly, I have found my purpose uh, through the work that I do and through the way I live my life. So I have learned practically that yoga starts within. Reaching our full potential is a natural outcome of the same. And I wish to share with you, give an overview of three tools that can help you to heal yourself. By bringing your first three koshas into yoga, your Annamai Kosh, that is your body, your Pranamai Kosh, that is your vital energy, your Manomai Kosh, that is your mind, your thoughts and emotions. And the three tools are yogic ahar, what you eat, yogic vyayam, how you move, how you rest, yogic vichar, how you think. Each of these tools acts on all three koshas. Our Vigyanamai Kosh, our Anandamai Kosh, which is our inner wisdom, our bliss body, that needs no healing. That is already healed. So we need to part all the clouds that are covering the sun, which we can do through these three tools that I have found very, very helpful in my journey of becoming swas, being swas as a natural outcome and not something to work towards. So here are three yogic tools for well-being. The first is nourishing your body through food, which we call yogic ahar. This covers the entire cycle, not just what you eat, but what are you procuring, where from, how are you cooking it, how are you eating, when you eat, how much you eat, everything is covered in this category of nourishing your body through yogic ahar. The third tool we'll see is how do you channelize your energy through movement and through relaxation, which is yogic vyayam. This covers a whole range of practices, loosening, breathing, grounding, sound resonance, relaxation, asan, pranayam, and many, many more practices. This is a whole body of work which the world today calls as yoga. But this is one of the tools within yoga. And the third tool we will look at is how do you know your mind and harness your emotions through peace, love, and joy, which is yogic vichar. This covers emotional intelligence, learning how do we understand our thoughts and emotions because our education system today has geared us to understand and manipulate the external world through mathematics, science, and arts, and commerce, all of these. But we have not learned how to deal with our own selves, our system, our thoughts, our mind, our emotions. So emotional intelligence is covered in this. And also how do we cultivate a yogic philosophy towards life? These are the through three yogic tools for well-being that we will explore. Let us see the first tool, which is how to nourish your body through food, through yogic ahar. So the principle here is to eat food, to make your kitchen your pharmacy. We don't need to chase superfoods. What we eat in our kitchen, what we get in our kitchen, if handled correctly, if procured correctly, can become our medicine. Why is this important? Because food is the material of which you are made. Our body, our annamai kosh, is made of an, which is the food that we eat. A baby grows because of the food that we eat, and that the baby eats. As adults, we are not growing, but there's a lot of replenishment of our cells that ha is happening on an everyday basis. So not just our body, but also our mind, our thoughts, our energy system, is all influenced by the food that we're eating because it has its own panchakosh, it has its own mind, thoughts, pranic system, which should influence ours. What should you eat? The principle is actually very simple. It is to have food and not to have food-like substance. Now you may say, obviously you will have food. Uh, what else can one have? You eat food after all. But the reason why this is important and around 200 years or so ago, we may not have needed a guideline as simple as this. The reason why this is important today is that a lot of what we're eating may be edible, but it is not food. It is a food-like substance. It's chemicals that mimic food and may be edible, but are doing a huge, huge damage to our body, energy, mind, and emotions. So let's see a few examples 
Uh, we'll actually look at a few brands and the idea is not to malign uh, any brand, but just to see some items from what has become day-to-day -day food uh, for us and see what could be the food like, uh, what's the food like substance and what's the food equivalent of that. So I'm going to share over here. We have tomato ketchup, noodles, fruit juices, jams, all of which will look very attractive. They're obviously very tasty and, and kids and not just kids, rather adults also can't resist these. So the question here is, what is the food equivalent of these food like substances? These are clearly not foods because of the chemicals, which is the preservatives, emulsifiers, uh, coloring agents, all kinds of things that are added to this. Uh, you'll see often at the back of these, if you turn the label, uh, turn the turn the packet, at the label you will see lots of numbers which are just standing for all the various chemicals that have been put into this. So ask yourself, from what you have seen your grandparents, so maybe even your great-grandparents, you may have imagined or heard of them having, what was the food equivalent of these food-like substances? What did they have instead of ketchup? that they could meet and that they could make at their home using their kitchen. The equivalent would be some chutneys, sauces that you can make at home. Instead of instant noodles, there is in India, there is vermicelli, uh, sevai that is had, also exists in many other cultures. In Instead of juices, people would have something like the actual extracting the actual juice from a, a mango, which in India is called amras, for example. Or instead of mixed fruit jam, there's actually uh, something called a murabba, where the fruits were actually naturally fermented and placed in jaggery where they could be had. So the idea is not to deprive ourselves of the taste, but to shift from having a food-like substance to actually having food. So something that is tasty as well as healthy for us. So it is very important to eat items that are closest to their natural form, where minimal processing has been done. White sugar, for example, here is the most processed. It's better than that is to have brown sugar. Better than brown sugar is jaggery. And even better than that is to have sugar cane. Instead of jam, the jam is derived from juices, for example, or the fruit and the pulp. And the best is to have the fruit directly. So the closer we go to the items in their natural form, the more nutrition, nourishment, the more pranic energy we will actually derive from that food. Let's look at this example of the percentage of nutrients that are lost when whole wheat flour, which is called atta in India, is converted and refined into white flour or maida. The source of this is Food Revolution by John Robbins. So in the process of refining whole wheat flour into white flour, from which bread is made, pasta is made, uh, a lot of Indian dishes are also made of it. So look at the percentage of nutrients lost. We're losing 95% of the fiber, 56% calcium, 84% iron, 60, 70, 70, 60. Look at the percentages of phosphorus, potassium, zinc, copper, manganese, all the nutrients, all the various vitamins are actually getting lost. The question remains, what are you consuming in the name of refined white flour? What is the nourishment that's actually going in? And it is not a surprise that supplements today are a multi-billion dollar industry. Why do we need to take supplements today? Our great grandparents did not need these supplements because we are not getting this in the food that we consume. If you're losing 56% of the calcium, then you're going to have to take tablets. If you're losing so much fiber, then eventually we will land up with issues of high cholesterol in our body. If we're losing 84% iron, no wonder such a high percentage of the women particularly are anemic. So eat food closest to its natural form. And here, the daily food items that we consume are very, very, very important. This is what is going into our food every single day. We have white iodized oil, uh, salt, sugar, white, right, white rice, and even whitish refined oil. 
So you can see from the colors, all of these are very, very bright. Our obsession with fairness runs into even the foods uh, that we eat. Unfortunately, with food and, not, and even with anything else, fair is not necessarily good. Rather, in this case, it's actually worse off. Why is the sugar or the rice uh, white? Because it has lost all the nutrients. The refined oil that we consume today, if you open a bottle, if you smell it, you cannot make out what was the source of this oil. It has lost all the smell because all the actual nourishment, the energy has been lost. And so what you're consuming is actually going to harm you. And this has now been very, very well established by research. For example, just one teaspoonful of sugar is shown to reduce our immune system activity within 30 minutes of consuming it. So replace white iodized salt with rock salt, with sandha namak, with sea salt if needed. Sugar with jaggery, white rice with brown rice, red rice, black rice, many, many varieties of unpolished rice where the nutrition is still alive and refined oil with cold pressed oil. These are four fundamental mistakes every single one of us across cultures, across geographies is making and it's leading to huge, huge health issues make these changes. Uh, you will not lose your taste. Uh, you will retain your taste, but you will also get your health back along with these four replacements. Especially be wary of foods that are claiming to be healthy. And what I'm showing here is one example. This is nowhere, uh, no way, again, something against Britannia, but it is to show you what is happening by the what the food industry is doing. Every single company uh, including many of our trusted brands, brands are doing in the name of foods that claim to be healthy. So this is just an example. Uh, let's remember that. So these are oat cookies, which have become very, very popular today because they're diabetic friendly. There is zero percent sugar added. Uh, they claim to be made out of oats, have complex carbohydrates and very, very high dietary fiber. So when you look at the face of it, it looks like a very healthy product. I myself have consumed it, not just uh, diabetic people in my family, but I myself have consumed it because I was thinking that this would be healthy. The truth could not be farther from this. This is actually worse than a simple biscuit that you could eat. This is actually worse. And let's see how. Look at the ingredients. It is oats, claiming to be oats cookies, but it's actually got 54.8% refined wheat flour. Oats are less than 10%. So it's not oats cookies, it's refined wheat flour cookies sprinkled with oats. It is not oats cookies, as the label claims. Refined flour, we saw, is bulk of, this bulk of the content. You can also see all of these numbers that I mentioned to you earlier, 500, 503, two emulsifiers. The names of these chemicals are so long that if you had to write them on the label, there would be no place to make all the claims of it being diabetic friendly because the names of the chemicals would take all the space. And so they've been contracted into numbers. But these numbers are what are ruining our health. Dough conditioners. Because why is the dough conditioner added? Because now oats have been added, which are making the uh, the, the biscuit or the cookie rougher in texture. We need to add a conditioner to it. And it's going to be a chemical conditioner that will get added. So these are all the food-like substances that are getting consumed. I want to go back. Even the artificial flavoring substance, the vanilla, the, but, the butter, everything, everything is essentially artificial that you're having over here. What is worse is that the food is being replaced by even more dangerous food-like substances. You can see, thanks to government regulations, the label mentions all of this. And you can see what the company needs to disclose because of the government regulations. This cookie contains sucralose. It is not recommended for children. If it's not recommended for children, then how can adults have this? Let's also see what are some of the side effects of the modifications, the healthy modifications that have been done. Even though no sugar is added in the product, there are additions that have been made, right? Sucralose. And so what has been added may have a laxative effect, right? 
Uh, and the artificial sweeteners we know now, research is proving more and more uh, with every passing day, we're getting more and more evidence that many of these artificial sweeteners cause many more health issues than what they actually solve. So what you're getting is something that's a lot more expensive and actually far less healthier than even the unhealthy cookie and that's available in the market. So do not fall for claims made by such companies. Turn around, look at the label, educate yourself on what is it that you're putting inside your body because that is going to become you. That cookie that you consume will become you. Let us now understand the second tool of yogic vyayam, which is how can we channelize our energy through movement and relaxation. And I'll share a few concepts, but we'll do this experientially. So firstly, yogic vyayam of all the tools is actually the easiest uh, to do. It requires absolutely no external equipment, doesn't require any budget. All it requires is a little bit of your time. And that's also perhaps the reason why the yogic uh, vyayam tools such as asan, pranayam, etc. have gained so much popularity because it's something that everyone can do irrespective of where they are, uh, budget, time, space, all kinds of constraints. What is important here, if I may summarize the principle, is to stimulate and relax. We often focus only on stimulation, working out, but there is also an importance of relaxation, of working in. And how do you do this? Where do you do this? You do this for your external organs and your internal organs. So oftentimes in our external organs, we're only focused on our biceps, abs, and things like that. But it's not just the external, it is also the internal organs. What's happening to your digestive system, your lungs. And so taking care of the entire system in a holistic manner is also important. Uh, therefore, in, in yoga, in yogic practices, it's not just around what you're doing, but how you are doing it. That becomes very, very important. And we'll do this through two experiments. The first experiment I'm going to invite you into uh, is just to get a sense of how our breathing pattern is currently. So I invite you to close your eyes, join me, close your eyes, take your attention inwards and just become aware of your breath. You don't need to change it, only observe with your eyes closed. And notice how deep or shallow is it? How rhythmic or not it is? Become aware of how your chest is moving. And place a hand on your abdomen, on your belly, the stomach to see if and how that's moving as you're breathing in and out. And gently open your eyes to come back. So what we saw is we're looking at the length of our breath, how rhythmic it is, and also the depth of it, which we did by placing a hand on our abdomen, feeling how our chest is moving. And more often than not, when we do this experiment, we find that there is very little to no movement that's happening in our abdomen area. Most of the breathing is happening here, and it's very shallow breathing. And that's why our breathing is also quick. So what that's doing is we are not using our full capacity of our lungs. We are meant to breathe up till our diaphragm. If you see a baby, when a baby is lying down on, on the bed, you can see a baby's stomach is moving up and down. The extent of movement is quite a lot compared to the way our stomach, our abdomen moves. And so that's also giving us a hint that our breathing system, uh, our breathing often becomes shallow. It becomes irregular. It lacks the rhythm and uh, also very, very quick and fast. So that's one of the things to become very aware of in your yogic practice. Oftentimes, our yogic practice just becomes about the movements. So you're stretching, going up, down, and doing all the asanas. But what is the natural state of breathing? So remember to tune into that. So naturally, for example, if you open up your arms, your chest is expanding, and so you should be breathing in. 
when you're contracting, you need to be breathing out. This is what will bring your body and your energy system, which is through your breath, those will come into alignment. Otherwise, your body may be going in one direction and you may be breathing in a different direction. So remember, for any practice that you're doing, what is the correct breathing pattern which is natural to the specific movement? That becomes very, very important. And to do it slowly, that's the next principle. Doing your practices slowly is extremely important for the breath and also for uh, the mind. And so what we're going to do is we will actually do a demo. Uh, I'm going to invite you to stand up. I'm going to play a video. I invite you to take a minute, stand up and do the practice along with the video. Kindly stand up. I'm going to share the video and you'll do your practice alongside. As you're standing up, extend your arm as is shown over here and bring it down. So we put our hand up and took it down. Please do this movement. I just notice what's the change, what's the shift in your body? How are you feeling as you're doing this? And continue standing. We'll do this once again. I'm going to show another video and I want you to see the video and match your movement to the video now. So stand up. Again, keep standing. And follow the pace of the person whom you're seeing in the video. Do every practice, every movement should be very, very slow. As slow as you can make it. That is very important as you're doing this. So slowly now, start moving your hand, taking it up a few degrees, gently continuing. See the video, make sure your hand is at the same end. 45 degrees to the floor. Slowly becoming parallel, not yet parallel to the ground. Coming parallel. Continue breathing. Now, turn your palm upwards as slowly as you can. Turn it upwards. And now again, start the journey of taking your hand up gently. It's like the hands of a clock, even slower than the second's hand. Feel all the sensations as you're doing this. Your hand is going up very gently, coming closer to your ear, but yet not touching it. Stretch your arm, it's going up. Your biceps are now beginning to. Come close and touch your ears. Your hand is now, arm is perpendicular to the floor, stretching up. Feel everything. And now slowly start coming down. At the same pace at which you went up. So you're coming down very slowly. Gravity might want to take your hand down, but make sure you are pacing yourself. And you may even start closing your eyes to notice what is coming up in your experience. How's your arm feeling? As it's coming down, slowly becoming parallel to the floor. Don't bring it down, turn it downwards. Slowly notice the change. And continue the journey downwards. Very, very gently. Feel the changes. What's happening in your hand, in your fingers? What rush of blood are you feeling? What's the temperature? Become aware of all these changes. Now, 
gently bringing your hand closer to your thighs, not yet touching, slowly bringing it close to your body and letting your hand relax. Now stay standing in this position, remain in a standing position. Continue to breathe and become aware of the changes in your arm. Every sensation, become aware of it. Temperature, tingling, tightness, heaviness, lightness. See what is your experience. Now compare your arms, compare the two hands where you did this with one arm and you haven't done the practice with the other and notice the difference in the experience of the two. And you may come back and sit down again. So this is also an activity uh, that we've done with hundreds of people and almost overwhelmingly we ask what was the difference in your experience? Where, in which of the practices do you feel that you actually did some work? It is overwhelmingly, rather every single person says it's the second practice to the point where at some point of time it becomes so heavy that you have to really, really hold yourself uh, and, and manage your energies. And so this is an example of how when you do something slow, it actually requires a lot more coordination, a lot more effort. So doing something slow does not mean that it loses its impact. Rather, it actually gives more impact. And that's why in, in yogic practices, we slowly start becoming more and more and more slow to the point where we reach the sthiti of asana, where there's total stillness and yet maintaining the relaxation in that posture. So based on this experience, some of the uh, key principles we'd like to share with you on yogic vayam are our three principles. One is to keep your body as slow as you can. Move your body as slow as you possibly can. What you did right now was an exaggeration. It's not how you need to do every practice, but it's to give you a sense of the importance of, of doing it slow. So what do you pace your body to? For example, if I'm doing my opening and closing my arms, I can go as slow as I want. But a good pace is the pace of your breath. So match the pace of your breath. Breathe slowly and take whatever time it needs for one inhalation. Match your hand, body, leg movements to that. In one exhalation, again, match the pace of your body to your breath. So those are your two koshas. Body is your anamai kosh, breath is your pranamai kosh. And the third kosh is your manomai kosh, your mind and emotions. So what do you do with your mind and emotions? Your mind is on your practice, on your body, on your breath. Does not go into what WhatsApp message is coming on your phone, what Instagram, Facebook alert is coming, what's happening, what you're going to do after this, what happened before this, or to listening to music, none of that. It is on your body and your breath. And that's how you align your body, breath, mind. Your annamaya, pranamaya, and manomaya kosh. And you harmonize them. It's like actually if you have three horses going off in three different directions, you would possibly go nowhere. But when you harness them, as a charioter does, brings them together, then you can go three times faster. So those are the three principles that you can incorporate into any practice that you're doing. Even if it's walking, even if it's running, jogging, how do you do this at the pace of your breath? How do you keep your mind inwards? Because that is what yoga is around, about harmonizing yourself. Breath is very, very important. It's the bridge between the mind and the body. So always, always remember the breath. And the mind is where it is said that the prana flows where attention goes. So wherever you take your mind is what, where uh, your pranic energy, your life energy will also start. Moving. So try to see how you can incorporate these principles into your yogic vyayam practice. Remember to relax also, not just stimulate. Stimulate and relax internal organs and external organs. Finally, Come to yogic vichar, which is how do we know our mind and harness our emotions. 
And this is particularly important today. Uh, mental health, uh, everyone understands, it's something that most people are struggling with. Even if now there's no name given of, a, of depression or anxiety, everyone is suffering from some level of stress. There's stress in our studies, career, family, relationships, personal learning, even spiritual journeys come with a lot of stress. And so the question is, why is it important to manage the stress? Even for our well-being, to manage our stress is very important because it has now been proven again scientifically that stress fundamentally reduces our immunity, our capacity to be in that state of homeostasis or yoga or harmony or well-being. So one of the pathways that has been traced uh, for how stress leads to health issues is called psychoendoneuroimmunology. Psycho refers to our mind. Endo refers to our endocrine system, which is our hormonal system. Neuro refers to our neural system, our nervous system, and immunology is the immunity. So it has been shown how when we are stressed, we release stress hormones, uh, such as uh, cortisol, adrenaline. And when these stress hormones remain in our system for long, then that starts disturbing our nervous system activity. And we know the nervous system activity will therefore impact every cell uh, of our system will get influenced if the nervous system is getting impacted. And then that leads to a reduced capacity to face health conditions. So what are the emotions uh, that take us away from this state of well-being? All the unpleasant emotions, if I may use that word, not negative, but unpleasant emotions such as fear, anxiety, guilt, sadness, anger, frustration, all of these emotions, when they stay in our system for a long time, that's when they stop supporting us. For some time, definitely they have a role to play. But as we had seen earlier, we remain stuck in these states for long. Long after the incident has happened, we remain in these, uh, in these states. And that's when they start impacting our well-being. So let's also briefly understand where and how this is rooted. This, these emotions are rooted in our primal emotion of fear, which is something that has been a very, very core part of our evolution also. So if you see any, anyone, in, if, or rather for us also, thousands of years ago, when we were in a jungle, if you were confronted by a lion, a tiger, what would you do? If you were really strong, maybe you'll try to fight it. Otherwise, you'll flight, you'll, you'll run away. And sometimes you may just not know what to do and you might just freeze on the spot. So these are the three responses or other reactions of fight, flight, and freeze, which are encoded into our primitive reptilian brain from which we have evolved. Because this is a basic fear for survival, uh, for our life. This would help us to encounter real dangers. What would happen is if in the past, when we were living in jungles, a fear, a, a, a dangerous situation would come, the energy that would be produced as a result of the changes in our body because of the fight, flight, freeze reaction, that energy would finally get used up in fighting, in, in running away. If we froze and we would be eaten, uh, so anyway, there was no energy left. But the energy would then get consumed and, and, the, and the process would end there. It would not accumulate a stress. Today, what happens, our context is different. We're no longer living in a jungle, in a forest. We don't have to worry about wild animals, most of us in civilized, so-called civilized societies. But we have the same fears that are getting triggered by every small incident that happens. So you're at work and your manager, your boss comes and says something to you, right? Our our sense of safety gets threatened. We feel we're not good enough and our fight, flight, freeze gets triggered. Someone says something to us about how we look. Our children say something to us. Our spouse or significant others say something. Every single thing, even what is happening on, on, on news, uh, ideologies have become such a core part of our identity that if someone says anything to threaten it, we get into fight, flight, freeze that more. And we remain stuck in it. Because one after another, we're getting triggered. We don't know what to do with this energy. You can no longer fight people in a civilized world. You don't do that. You can't run away uh, from your work, from difficult situations at home. And so that leads to stress getting accumulated and manifesting as disease. This in yogic terms was called adhija vyadhi. 
when adhi that is something in the mind gives janam to gives birth to a vyadhi a, a actual physical health issue adhi vyadhi is what is called psychosomatic ailments today and most of the chronic health issues that we talked about are actually all stress born so what's the summary what's 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 the what's the solution what's the way out one way to approach it the way we approach it is to work on the fear and the antidote to fear is faith to cultivate faith the faith can be in ourselves in our capacities our capabilities the faith can be in other people in whatever life is throwing to us faith can be in universe in god in ishwar whatever we believe in to have some faith will ground us otherwise we'll get lost in a fight flight freeze response reaction and we won't be able to respond thoughtfully to a situation so cultivate faith and the second is to cultivate peace love and joy to cultivate these states how can you do this simple practices you can choose there are a wide variety of tools that are available today uh, to cultivate some of these things you can choose any object it can be a person it can be a, a person living or dead or anything it can be any religious figure non religious figure even yourself even nature that you believe in and have some faith do a practice some practice where you can connect to that faith which is the marg of bhakti yoga uh you can cultivate peace through meditation the lots of meditations are available today uh to ground yourself to relax yourself cultivate joy spend 5 minutes just 5 minutes a day doing something that you love rest of your day you're doing everything for everyone do something you love and you will find that this joy works as a prescription medicine it actually heals you from deep inside cultivate love do approach life as seva uh, as service you can do this in your work by serving everyone approaching everyone you work with with a service mindset you can also volunteer with non profit organizations and serve them so in summary the idea is to cultivate faith in any object any subject of your choice and to move towards peace love and joy and in this process say no to things that take you away from your swa from yourself whether it's social media excessive news relationships that are toxic that are not serving you say no to this and say yes to being in your swa to being in yourself summarize here are the three yogic tools for well being nourish your body through food remember what we said to make your kitchen your pharmacy and to eat food not food like substances to channelize your energy through movement and relaxation stimulation and relaxation remembering to keep make sure your body is slow it's matched to your breath and your mind is on your body and breath when you're doing your yogic vyaya and thirdly to know your mind to harness your emotions through peace love and joy through yogic vichar pick something that gives you joy meditate love and serve and cultivate faith each of these practices will align some aspect of our body energy mind and emotions all of them together will allow our inner wisdom to emerge for us to feel free to be me to be stiff in our swa to be healthy to be joyful and to be in a state of yoga and not just do yoga that is my wish for you our wish at swas and at indian yoga association for you with that we will bring this session to a close with the prayer request you to join me in this om sarve bhavantu sukhinah sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashe dukh bhave om shanti shanti shanti
Thank you. May you remain healthy. May you remain joyful. Thank you very much.